Well, let's just uh, ultimately then, I think some investors would like to know, is uh, the banking sector in the U.S. still at risk today, given that, A, uh, the Fed funds rate has still remained high. There's still no cut yet. Um, the uh, the average consumer is perhaps facing uh, pressures from these higher interest rates on their living costs. And uh, we're seeing people talk about a potential slowdown in the economy do all these factors play in negatively or weigh down negatively on the banking sector or not so much? I think the biggest factor is actually this lulling but uh, increasingly worrisome crisis in commercial real estate. Our next guest is Luigi Zingales. He is a professor of entrepreneurship and finance at the University of Chicago Booth. Uh, he has written uh, a book called Saving Capitalism from the Capitalist, Unleashing the Power of Financial Markets to Create Wealth and spread opportunity, and he co-hosts a podcast called Capitalism Isn't. Uh, we'll be talking about that, and he's um, also a regular contributor to many important financial outlets, including the New York Times and the Financial Times, uh, in which he's written a number of op-eds regularly. He's also testified at the U.S. Congress on the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy in 2008, and he has advised the Minneapolis Fed. Certainly a very a stellar CV and uh, and background, professors and Gallus. I'm very honored to be hosting you. Thank you for being here today. My pleasure. I want to start by talking about broader themes, um, and then we can get into some of your current work. Uh, investors are concerned about um, many things this year. Um, we just started the year. Last year, you were on a number of media programs talking about the banking crisis and how the banking crisis was unfolding. Certainly, the banking crisis, the regional banking crisis in the U.S., is no longer a topic of uh, consideration or interest for investors today, what would be the primary risks for investors and economists alike to be focused on either domestically or globally? Let's start there. If you say the primary risk is, I'm sorry to say, war with China. I think that uh, uh, the escalation in, in uh, around Taiwan is, uh, is pretty scary. And uh, I think that uh, if I were China and I wanted to invade uh, Taiwan or take possession of Taiwan, uh, there would be hardly a better moment than this one, with the United States distracted uh, uh, by the Ukrainian war, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and the local elections. This is like a, a golden moment to escalate the tension. Professor, that's a very good point. Uh, why would you make the assumption that taking Taiwan by force would be their primary option? Could they not do it with other means? perhaps through a referendum, perhaps through a negotiation? Um, what do you think China's primary objective would be, is my question. Uh, you're absolutely right. And if I imply that necessarily uh, they would take it with force, uh, I, I misspoke because I think that uh, my expectations are that uh, uh, China will slowly uh, get possession of uh, Taiwan, uh, forcing uh, the United States to choose between a war or let it go. And I think that that would be the, uh, the, the tension. And uh, I was reading just the other day that uh, they're starting something like this in a little island, uh, Kiwi, and I forgot the name, that is uh, very close to the coast of China. Um, and, uh, and I think that, uh, um, is, in my view, there is no doubt that uh, uh, China wants to uh, get Taiwan, and uh, so sooner or later they will get it. And uh, it doesn't seem that Taiwan is particularly willing to go, <laughs> uh, at least look at the last election. So I think that uh, uh, some, something has to give. Okay. Uh, part of your research focus is political economy and how that impacts the financial markets. Uh, tell us, Professor, do you think the United States can remain the global hegemon or superpower for the foreseeable future? Because I think that starting point, that assumption, could impact um, a lot of other areas. So I think that uh, there is no doubt that the United States uh, is facing the biggest challenge uh, has ever faced since uh, it became an hegemon today. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, in a normal world, I think the United States uh, should try to find a modus operandi, a way of living, in a diarchy with uh, with China, because uh, it's inevitable, given the uh, power of China, the rising power of China, that uh, there will there is some form of uh, agreement. And uh, I think that uh, uh, 
I'm not so sure that uh, the United States is prepared to give some uh, power to China. I'm not so sure that uh, China wants to have a, a core leadership rather than a unique leadership. And uh, in addition, I think that the uh, uh, complicated political situation at home makes the uh, United States very vulnerable. Right. Uh, but in what sense is the United States more vulnerable today than, let's say, it was 70 years ago after the Second World War? Oh, uh, I think that uh, uh, there was a gigantic technological lead in favor of the United States. Uh, they, uh, the United States had uh, by far uh, the best uh, uh, army uh, and uh, had a very strong uh, um, democracy at home and a very powerful message uh, uh, throughout the world. And it says, I think that the soft power matters and uh, the United States was uh, the force uh, for good in, in most of the world. And uh, uh, my mother, uh, still remembers the time when uh, Americans arrived in Venice, and for her was the day of liberation, and uh, she loved America ever since. The reason why I'm in the United States is in part because uh, uh, she loved America so much. Okay, uh, and, and, and that same sentiment is no longer, I guess, echoed around the world is what you're saying? I fear that if you go in a lot of places around the world, uh, especially uh, the... Uh, developing nation in the world, uh, they don't uh, echo the same sentiment today. Okay. Now, if the United States is no longer the global hedge month, I think the obvious question is who would take their place? I think that the, the most dangerous situation is a situation of uncertainty. And this is a, a lot of uh, um, historian claims that the period between World War I and World War II was a period of very high instability because of the lack of a global hegemon. England was a global hegemon up to World War I. Uh, the United States uh, uh, has been since World War II. In between, uh, there was a lack of hegemony, and that created an enormous amount of instability. So I think that uh, if you ask me, so the, the, the biggest risk is by far this one. Okay. Uh, in the past, when there wasn't one sole superpower uh, in the world, uh, there has tended to be more regional, in fact, even global conflicts. In fact, when we've observed history and throughout history, when we've observed the periods of um, the most stable um, and most prosperous eras, it's usually when there's one or two dominant superpowers. Um, first of all, could you could you evaluate that statement? And second, if is it is indeed true that a lack of a superpower portends conflict, then is the assumption that we will see more conflict, armed conflict, in the future? Um, yes, and particularly at a higher level. And this is not that uh, since World War II we didn't have conflict, uh, but they tended to be more localized and in periphery rather than uh, uh, really involving a, a lot of nations and being uh, at a higher level of uh, bloodiness, if you want. I think that uh, there is more risk uh, of uh, of an escalation level of conflict. Yes. Okay. Uh, finally, what do you, on the topic of geopolitics? Uh, what do you think is the priority for the U.S. in relation to global uh, affairs and foreign policy? Uh, I ask this because the elections are coming up this year, and certainly that will be on the agenda. What is the attitude of the U.S. Uh, for the next administration? Is it one of protectionism and isolation? Is it one of global expansion and heightened influence? Is it containing uh, the rise of China? What do you think their primary objective should be? Uh, what it should be or what it will it be? And as I say, in, in terms of uh, what it will it be, both parties seem to uh, share uh, some concern with China. So I think that some opposition to China would be regardless of who gets elected. However, there is a gigantic difference on uh, the value of international relations, in particular the, the value of NATO. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, President Trump, or former President Trump, uh, claiming that if he's elected, he's going to leave NATO in Europe. And that, that would be a major sort of uh, instability factor in Europe. Professor, you have an interesting course at uh, Chicago Booth. It's called Crony Capitalism. Um, I, I think it ties into some of your work in your podcast as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about this course? I've never in my 
uh, four years of finance <laughs> at a finance at a business school, studied a course called crony capitalism. Um, is, is that one of the courses that they put on just to give students another perspective? Is that, is that... Um, I think it's more than that. First of all, this is a course uh, open both to undergraduate and MBAs, okay. right? And uh, advanced undergraduate and MBAs, and it's really trying to give a, a global perspective. Uh, uh, since the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the perception was that there was only one form and was capitalist, was triumphant, etc. And uh, since then, we've seen a lot of distortion. And so capitalism is not just one form um, and uh, is not always working. And uh, uh, I think there is a lot of need to fix it rather than destroy it. I think that uh, I divide people between those who... Uh, hate capitalism and want to destroy it in every possible form or shape, and the one who love it and uh, they want only to celebrate. I'm one of the few who is in the middle and said, I, I think that capitalism is great, has made uh, a fantastic achievement, but there are a lot of distortions, and uh, we need to try to, to understand how to fix those distortions and, and to uh, prevent uh, capitalism to become uh, a form of plutocracy or to become... Uh, a form of uh, chronic capitalism where sort of uh, friends and family are uh, rewarded rather than people that produce innovation and increase uh, the wealth of everybody. Okay, well, but, but let, let's break it down for the layman, for those of us who may not be uh, political economists. What mm -hmm. is wrong with capitalism today? I mean, you and I are both products of a capitalist society. You and I have accumulated wealth and prosperity to some degree through a capitalist system what is wrong with the society that we live in today? Uh, so I think that uh, to what extent uh, the way we accumulated wealth is something that improves everybody or is simply uh, an opportunity of uh, Peter Steele from Paul. Uh, I think that that's, uh, that's one of the, uh, the big tension. Or to what extent uh, 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 large corporations ignore some of the externalities they produce, for example, uh, uh, pollution, and I'm not just saying about CO2, but even uh, other form of pollution that uh, kill people around them. Uh, I think that uh, we need uh, some form of uh, uh, regulation or liability to uh, prevent uh, this from happening. However, uh, in many countries, uh, this regulation of this uh, liability system is impeded by the fact that uh, capitalists tend to have also a lot of political power. So I think that the problem is uh, uh, we would like a system with a uh, uh, rule that uh, uh, allow a level playing field, but most of the time the capitalists make uh, the rules and uh, they make the rules uh, tilted in a way that uh, they win and everybody else lose. Okay. Uh, does this partly explain the rising wealth gap in particularly the United States, where you, if you look at data from the same, from the, from the federal reserve, for example, you can see that the, the top 1% has been accumulating wealth, um, mostly in reflection of the rising stock markets while the bottom 50%, which, um, doesn't actually hold the majority of the wealth in the U S uh, has actually been flat, if not decreasing slightly in their total wealth. Um, I how would you it, explain it, it, I, yes. It's connected, but I, I have to say I'm not against people becoming rich. I think yes. that if they become rich by uh, inventing uh, phenomenal new devices, uh, kudos to them. Uh, what I'm uh, more concerned uh, is when they become rich by selling opioids or by changing some uh, rules of the game or by uh, taking advantage uh, of lax regulation to dump uh, toxic waste uh, next to your house. Uh, and so on and so forth. That that's a kind of uh, distortive uh, system that we'd like to uh, uh, reduce. Okay, uh, is there a way that we can we can improve the system somewhat? I've talked to several people about this topic. Actually, people have different <laughs> ideas or ideals of the future, depending on their ideologies. Some people have. Um, proposed a return to a more socialist environment. Some people have proposed uh, we don't change anything. What is your solution? So, first of all, I have to admit, I don't have a, a silver bullet. If I did, I would be uh, rich and famous, but I'm not. And uh, I think what I'm working on is trying to figure out, for example, whether in some activities 
don't we want uh, uh, some mixed form between the non-for-profit and the fully for-profit? And yes, the, in the United States and probably also in Canada, there is this instrument called public benefit corporation, but it's not really, I think it's more a marketing device that a substantive difference. The point is, if I, suppose I run a hospital, uh, do I really want to maximize profits in every form or shape? Uh, no, because uh, there are some choices that might be very dangerous. And if you are sick, you probably want to go to a non-for-profit hospital, not a for-profit hospital, because you are concerned that they might skip on the quality of uh, surgery to save some money. And uh, I think that, uh, uh, on the other hand, the non-for-profit tend to be not very well managed. If you think about uh, universities to begin with, they're not particularly well managed. So I, uh, corporations uh, have improved dramatically the way they're managed since the 1970s. Um, and uh, I think to some extent, they've become too efficient for their own good because they're very good in only one dimension. And uh, uh, we are leaving behind all the other dimension. Uh, and uh, non-for-profits are still at the stone age in terms of uh, quality of management. Okay. Do you believe that the average American in particular uh, is more well off in terms of his living standards than, let's say, 50 years ago in the 70s? Um, I would say that the median American is not. Uh, the average American doesn't exist uh, okay. uh, because of the combination of. But if you look at the median, I think that... Uh, uh, the uh, rise in wage uh, has been pretty uh, flat, actually, since 1970 today. So I don't think there is a probably is a little bit better off, but it's not dramatically better off. And and I think that that's one of the uh, causes of the malaise in the United States that uh, uh, the United States is the land of opportunity, or at least has been sold as a land of opportunities, uh, where every generation does better than the previous one, and has been so, uh, by and large, has been true until recently, but now it's not true anymore. Is that is a, a result of technological progress or uh, real wages rising uh, or a combination of the above or other things? I think it's been a combination of factors. Is uh, One is not explaining all. I think technology clearly plays a role, but you know, technology could potentially be managed politically. I think technology is not a exogenous factor is uh, uh, in part is exogenous, but in part it can be managed. And uh, I think that the, the question is, are we willing to manage in a way that uh, uh, make everybody better off or are we willing to manage in a way that only benefit a few? Going, looking forward now, Professor, are you, are you concerned about uh, the decline of living standards for the median person? I use the word median person. Uh, people are concerned that maybe their wages won't be able to keep up with inflation. People are concerned about uh, fiscal and monetary policies working against them. Uh, people are concerned about, uh, well, the 2020 pandemic has shaken the world and people are concerned about another black swan event wiping out wealth. Um, what, what, what do you think is going to happen to the median person watching this interview today? So I think that uh, if you look at the United States, Canada is a bit different, but if you look at the United States, uh, I think that uh, part of the political turmoil the United States is going through is the result of this uh, uh, unequal growth in the standard of living. Uh, I always like to, to make uh, uh, the, the joke that it takes uh, a Latin American economy to elect a Latin American president. And we always thought that in Latin America, there were all these crazy presidents because it's Latin America. No, it's because the economy there is so divided and the income inequality is so extreme. And as the United States is, is looking more like a Latin American economy, it started to elect presidents that are uh, different than the traditional president we've seen in the past. Okay. Uh, finally, I'd like to close off on some of the work you've done on the banking sector. You've talked about this on your podcast as well. Uh, Capitalist isn't. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit more. And you've written uh, a number of papers on this. Um, 
in 2023, you wrote, you co-wrote, you co-authored a paper on the stability of digital banking. Um, also on the Chicago Booth website, there's a paper that you co-authored um, on why your banking app may spell trouble for your bank. I'll just read a paragraph to summarize, and I'll let you discuss a little bit more uh, what you're referring to here. Uh, it says transferring cash from one account to another has become almost comically easy. M moving money from a deposit to a money market fund can be done with a single mouse click without leaving your sofa. Uh, writes Columbia PhD student Nas Kunt. Um, uh, this ease of online banking has been uh, has big implications for financial stability. They argue um, you were a co-author of this paper. At times when the federal funds rate rose in the past, depositors were slow to move their money out in search of higher interest. But as banks and brokerages have worked to make their services more accessible and convenient, they have reduced this inertia and made banking less secure. Uh, you've based your findings on a data from 4,000 banks uh, U.S. in the U.S. between 2010 and 2012. Uh, tell us about the results of your research and your findings and why it is that, I guess, um, more convenience may lead to more instability, if if I'm understanding this correctly. No, you understand perfectly correctly. I think that actually the idea of this paper came when I interview uh, a former regulator in the United States uh, on my podcast, Capitalism. And uh, he was actually much less worried about me about uh, instability in the bank sector. And he said, oh, um, no problem, because even if uh, these banks have a lot of losses uh, <laughs> on the asset side of the balance sheet, uh, they are going to uh, survive because deposits are sticky. And so uh, they're not gonna go away. And, and so I said, wait a minute, are you saying that uh, they, uh, they are gonna survive because they can consistently pay the depositors much less than the current interest rate. So it's because uh, the current interest rate is yeah. in the United States is five and three, four, uh, three, eight, whatever it is, uh, and they pay five basis points, that difference is the source of stability. And he said, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and okay, so this uh, sounds right for the past. I'm not so sure is going to be true moving forward. Because uh, moving forward, we're going to have a system that automatically move our funds to maximize uh, our return. Right. And so this stickiness will disappear. So the, the digital economy will bring a lot of benefits to consumers, uh, but will reduce the ability of banks to uh, absorb losses. And, uh, and so I think that... Uh, what we're documenting in the paper is that we are in this transition and banks that uh, are ahead in the game with uh, mobile banking and uh, digital uh, banking, uh, they observe more of a sensitivity of their customers when interest rate rise. And so uh, this is just the beginning in our view of a world in which uh, this sensitivity will be almost perfect and so banks will be uh, much less stable. Professor, I'm I'm just based on what you've said. Um, have you considered differentiating between wealthy clients of banks and I guess the median customer of banks? Suppose you have only ten thousand dollars in deposits, you're not really going to be overly concerned if the money market fund rises, uh, rate rises from three to five percent. You won't have a material impact on interest. Uh, on your interest income. If you have $10 million in your bank, then yes, I think that what you described would have a material impact. And so not everyone will be incentivized to withdraw their funds simply because the money market rate rises, correct? I think you are correct. But first of all, if you have $10 million, you generally don't keep it in the bank. Okay. And two, um, I think you'll be surprised how smart people are, especially when they have little money. Uh, because uh, if you have a lot of money, you might be more relax, but if you have little money, you're trying to get the best return on everything you have. And so I think that uh, uh, there are a lot of people with, with $10,000 that are going to move uh, at least half of them in the money market. Okay. Uh, was that basically what, was that the primary cause of some of the bank failures we saw last year in 2023? No, no, let, let's not get uh, this wrong. The, the primary yeah. cause is the fact they lost a lot of money. So they invested massively in long-term securities interest rate went up and they lost a lot of money, okay? But uh, uh, the question is why not every bank is failing Yes, is because they have an, a cushion to absorb some of these losses and uh, that cushions 
is given by the fact that they keep the rates low to a lot of depositors. Uh, but that cushion is going to be eroded by digitalization in the future. So the problem is not so much today, but is moving forward. Okay. I'm looking at data from the St. Louis Fed. Money market funds um, are at an all-time high in total assets, uh, totaling uh, yeah, more than $6 trillion as of Q3 2023. Uh, this is primarily a, a result of the higher interest rates that you discussed, is it not? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And you have a chart here that actually shows an inverse correlation between deposits and higher rates. So uh, again, that is, that is a result of people wanting to park their money in higher yielding assets. And so higher rates would be, I guess, uh, just detrimental for, for the banking sector and overall. Is that a fair statement to make? It's not necessarily detrimental because higher rates also offer the opportunity for banks to have a higher return on their investment. Right. But if they face a loss, it's more, it's more difficult to absorb the loss when the deposits are more mobile. Okay. Well, let's just uh, ultimately then, I think some investors would like to know, is uh, the banking sector in the U.S. still at risk today, given that, A, uh, the Fed funds rate has still remained high? There's still no cut yet. Um, the uh, the average consumer is perhaps facing uh, pressures from these higher interest rates on their living costs. And uh, we're seeing people talk about a potential slowdown in the economy do all these factors play in negatively or weigh down negatively on the banking sector or not so much? I think the biggest factor is actually this lulling but uh, increasingly worrisome crisis in commercial real estate. Okay. I think that uh, uh, banks, especially regional banks, are heavily invested in commercial real estate. Uh, I think that uh, uh, so far the strategy has been extend and pretend so extend the loans and pretend things will go away. Uh, but I, my view is that this crisis in commercial uh, real estate is not uh, one of the normal cyclical crises. It's more a structural crisis because uh, there is uh, less need for retail and less need for offices. And so uh, eventually there will be an adjustment down in the real estate prices and the banks are trying to delay that adjustment but eventually they're going to have to take it. And then the question is, uh, uh, do they have enough equity to absorb this loss or not? So we're back to the same question we had a year ago once these uh, 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 losses will be realized. Okay. Um, do you see a potential threat to the banking sector arising from decentralized banking, uh, particularly from cryptos? You can now, we're living in an age where you can uh, park a lot of your cash or cash equivalent in, let's say, a Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency in a decentralized wallet where you custody your own money. Um, not everyone's doing this, obviously, but can you see this becoming more popular to the extent that banks will either have to uh, deal with losses potentially or have to adopt this technology themselves? I think that the biggest threat is on uh, money transfer and it's particularly remittances. I think banks make a lot of money out of remittances, especially small amounts. And um, I think this business is going to be eroded by uh, some form of crypto stable coins or even some other form of mobile banking. And, uh, and so that's a sector that, uh, um, yeah, they're going to they're gonna lose uh, that share of profits. Okay. Uh, I don't see uh, a... The or an investment in Bitcoin as an alternative to a deposit. So I don't see uh, them losing that advantage. Tell us a little bit about your podcast, Capitalist Isn't. Um, you've been doing this for a number of years. You told me offline. What are some of the topics we cover there? And perhaps the viewers can find your channel and learn more about. So I think that uh, uh, it's very much in sync with my course. I try the title, the strange title, Capital Isn't, is... Uh, uh, to express so that we are discussing what is working in capitalism and what isn't. And so we are trying to uh, deal with uh, a lot of uh, current issues from the banking crisis to private equity to the crisis in the world of newspapers um, uh, to, through the lens of uh, uh, what is working uh, as a system and what is not uh, working. One of the 
uh, most interesting series of episodes that we had is one was about uh, meritocracy with uh, some uh, three episodes uh, linked to meritocracy from different point of view. Uh, we have two episodes uh, with two very different points of view uh, about uh, uh, poverty. So I think one of the unique characteristics of uh, the podcast is we ask uh, people from all over the political spectrum. So we have from uh, uh, Varoufakis, who is uh, at the extreme left, uh, to yes. uh, Oren Cass or uh, Patrick Deenan, who are the, not extreme, but pretty much right. So I think that uh, we like to, to have an intellectual debate on uh, some important topic uh, with everybody who has uh, an idea. Right. Okay. Interesting. We'll put a link to your podcast down below. Final question, Professor. You also um, are involved with teaching entrepreneurship at Chicago Booth, I, I believe. Um, I'm curious as to, it's, it's been many years since I was in school, so I'm curious as to what the students are interested in right these days in regards to entrepreneurship. What sorts of sectors are they interested in? And if they were to start their own business or start up, which, which types of businesses are they interested in? Do you have an idea? Oh, yeah. And, this is a, and now I teach a course specific in fintech because that's an area where people are very eager to jump in. Uh, I think that uh, the opportunities are shrinking. In the beginning, they were enormous. And now they are shrinking, but there's still uh, room uh, in that sector. And there are a lot of people interested in that. In it. The, the, the AI boom has certainly been <laughs> all over the news. Is uh, How are students integrating this trend in their areas of work right now? So I think that... Uh, uh, we're still absorbing uh, the, the uh, how to integrate this. And, uh, you know, in the business school, most of the people are not expert in AI. We have some who are, but it's not uh, um, an area, a traditional area of expertise. But mm -hmm. I think it's changing uh, a lot of things from the way we uh, give assignments, because uh, it's easy now to produce with ChatGPT, uh, to the way we do re research now is a piece of cake to do it's okay because it's an exaggeration, but it's easy to do qualitative research. To, so to extract uh, information out of annual reports. Uh, I have a paper, for example, trying to look at uh, the uh, objective of firms over time, starting in 1955 to today. What do they say to their shareholders? What, is, uh, what goals they present and how they change over time? And this study would have been impossible without uh, some form of uh, large language model. Certainly, you've been asked this many times before. If for the people out there watching who is not a student of yours at Chicago Booth, what advice would you give us who are interested in uh, entrepreneurship and starting our own businesses, whether it be fintech or something else? Maybe maybe we don't know what we want to do. Maybe we are just looking to start a business and take part of this crony capitalist system that you discussed. <laughs> no, it, it, quite the opposite. It takes okay. part of the good part of the system. Okay. Which is to produce innovation, right. and and my advice is uh, acquire domain specific knowledge. I think that the best entrepreneurs I've seen are people who know their space very well. And once you have the knowledge, uh, is much easier to number one have the ideas, and number two have the contest to develop that idea. Uh, I always quote a sentence. I forgot who said, but that uh, chance favors prepare mind, and uh, you need to prepare yourself to have that chance. Uh, without the preparation, the chance is useless. So just going on that, would you maybe advise younger people to join the workforce first, acquire some specific domain expertise before starting their business? I ask this because when I was in my early 20s, many of my friends decided to do startups right away. Uh, yes, and you know... Uh... Zuckerberg has been very successful starting out of college. So yes. I'm not saying that uh, uh, this is always the case. Z Zuckerberg, uh, I actually just, just uh, he, I saw him in an interview. Uh, he said that, uh, yeah, exactly. He started his business when he was in university and his dorm room. Yeah. He had no experience. And so he says that experience is really not the most important factor determining success as an entrepreneur. Do you agree or disagree? I think by and large, I disagree. And it says there are exceptions. Uh, and uh, if you're Mark Zuckerberg, that expression is pretty salient for you. But I think that the rule uh, is that uh, domain expertise helps tremendously in starting a company. Professor, thank you very much for your time today. Where can we learn more about your work? I mentioned your podcast. Is there anywhere else? Uh, no, I think my podcast, my, my website at the University of Chicago.
Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll speak again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.